One Punch Man has a multiverse. The multiverse is real. Sounds pretty silly, I know, and some might even go as far as to say that it sounds stupid. You stupid! But to those people I say, hey, I'm just spitting facts, bro. There's actually hard evidence in the manga to prove this. And more importantly, the existence of a multiverse in One Punch Man might lead to truly devastating events in the near future. Events that Saitama himself might not be able to fix. A multiverse was actually confirmed by One himself in chapter 166 of the manga. In this chapter, Saitama does the unthinkable and literally uses his own power to travel back in time. He does this to prevent the world from being ruined like it had been because of Garo. In the original timeline, Garo's cosmic radiation had deleted every hero present at his arrival, and it had done irreversible damage to the Earth itself. It was pretty much GG's for everyone and everything on Earth. So once Garo teaches Saitama how to go back to undo everything, he travels back to the moment that Garo first appeared in his cosmic fear form and delivered the iconic zero punch, stopping the fight before it even began. In this moment, Saitama had total control over causality. It's then revealed that for a brief moment, there were two Saitamas. One was the Saitama that did the actual time traveling, you know, the super buff naked one, and the other one was from the timeline that he traveled to. Sounds kind of confusing, but don't you worry. It actually gets much, much more confusing from here on out, but also much more interesting. The two Saitamas merge, leaving him with no memories of anything that happened in the prior timeline, with only Genos' core as a souvenir from all the crazy things that naked Saitama just experienced. So once Saitama meets back up with Genos, who's still alive in this timeline of course, this is where the One Punch Man multiverse theory really starts to become more of a fact than a theory. Genos gains access to the data that the core obtained, which allowed him to essentially witness everything that had transpired in the doomed timeline. His own death, the fight on Io, the serious sneeze, the serious fart, everything. To try and explain how this was all possible to Saitama, he gives this super long-winded explanation that comically goes in one ear and comes out the other for Saitama, and I'm sure like 99% of the people that originally read this statement. I know on the first read, I pretty much just read the first sentence and then moved on, but the thing is though, if you read the first sentence of what he says, Genos actually reveals something crazy. The world of One Punch Man is actually infinite infinitely bigger than we thought, a whole freaking multiverse, and this realization has some pretty heavy implications for the story as you're about to see. But I'm going to start with the biggest question of all in One Punch Man that I know that each of you have asked yourself at some point. If I were in One Punch Man, would I be able to riz up Tatsumaki? I read your mind, didn't I? Well thanks to Facemoji, I finally found that answer. That's because I used their new riz response feature to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her, and the results were pretty crazy. It's not just meant for fictional waifus though, because you can use this intelligent AI keyboard to help you navigate conversations with friends or a potential crush, and do it way better than socially awkward weebs like us ever could. Case in point, I went on talkie and knocked on Tatsumaki's front door. Just before pulling up the sweet custom keyboard I built out on Facemoji beforehand, you gotta come dressed to impress, you know? Well, you can customize your own by trying Facemoji with my link in the description, and get access to the Riz feature I'm about to use right now. So she answers the door, and as you can see I get a pretty hostile greeting to start, but let's see if we can change that. Okay, so let's just take something that I would normally say like, hey Tatsumaki, and let's let's riz it up. Let's make it a flirty one. Alright, let's give it a shot. Rolls her eyes, keep dreaming, I don't know what you're thinking, but I would never date some loser or can't even take care of himself. Well, let's see if some flattery is gonna work. How about this one? Alright, let's. you know what, let's see how it works. Finally, someone who appreciates my company. Let's make the most of this date. And boom, just like that, it's a date. So Tatsumaki seems to change her tune pretty quickly, and she goes from telling me to kick rocks pretty much to being totally down to go on a date. Well, unfortunately though, the grave mistake I made next definitely cost me. I got cocky and turned off the wrist feature for my next few responses, and they weren't too great. Okay, here we go. Hey, since we're bros now, can we make out? As if, not with you though. I'd rather get struck by lightning, damn. Okay, um, but we can still make out though? Question mark? All right, so I definitely fumbled that one. Mission failed, we'll get him next time. Had I kept using the wrist feature, I'm sure we could have called this one a win, but oh well. Don't make the same mistake I did. Try Facemoji today by clicking the link in my description or by searching Facemoji keyboard in the Apple or Google Play stores. 
His first line in this long-winded explanation goes as follows. To explain briefly, consider parallel worlds. This is all speculation based on the hypothesis of the multiverse, but I suspect that this core is from one of the many world lines that an action of yours created. Essentially, Genos is trying to describe a theory that actually exists in real life, the many worlds theory or the many worlds interpretation. In simple terms, this theory states that every action performed or not performed exists in their own alternate worlds, meaning that all possible outcomes to anything that has ever existed creates its own alternate world where each possible outcome plays out. I'm sure I'm butchering the explanation a little bit because I'm not a physicist or anywhere near smart enough to be one, but there's a One Punch Man example that I came up with that helped my smooth brain understand it all. So let's say for example that Saitama is rushing to the supermarket to get in on the sale of the day before they close. About halfway there, he hits a fork in the road where he has two routes to take his left or his right. Both take him to the supermarket, but only the left one would get him there on time. Saitama takes the left path and happily gets there just in time to catch the crab sale before they close. If we assume the many worlds theory to be true, when Saitama hit that fork in the road, the moment he decided to go left, another world existed where Saitama ended up going right, and therefore missed the sale. Every possible choice plays out in some other alternate universe, no matter what choice you make in this one. The reason I'm taking this much time to explain all of this is because it is crucial to understanding what this could potentially mean for future plot points in the story. So following this theory, at some point Saitama made a decision that created multiple world lines, just like Genos pointed out, one of them being the timeline that we witnessed in the manga, the one where everyone died. Saitama then travels back to a world line where none of that happened yet, and then takes care of business before any of it happens. The kind of iffy part is is deciding whether or not the two world lines converged and became one, or you know, something else. This is something else. But thankfully that's not important to us right now. The last and probably most important line we're gonna look at here in Genos's super long explanation is when he comments on the fact that Saitama time traveled to save everybody. He says, Garo killed me in the time from which this core originates, yet even if you held back, and no matter how near to infinity the number of existing world lines may be, Garo beating you is an impossibility. This means that no matter what happens in any other alternate world, Saitama saves everyone and that will always be the case in this scenario. Therefore making this Saitama the only absolute certainty in every possible alternate universe. But why is that important to know? That's a great question, me, and I'm gonna give you a pretty damn good answer. The reason this is so important is because now that we know there is a multiverse in One Punch Man, this gives transcendent beings like God a much bigger playground than we originally thought. It's now possible that there's either many gods in each one of these alternate universes, or a single god that can observe and influence all of them as one being. Regardless of which one it is, God has his or their eyes on Saitama. This was something that was revealed in Chapter 170, when Sitch has his top secret meeting with Genos, Zombie Man, Amai Mask, and Flashy Flash. There he states, Blast says God is intervening in this dimension more often, because something is here attracting its attention. As he says this, we see an image of Saitama facing away from the panel, so it's heavily implying that Saitama is the reason why. Now having all this multiverse stuff in mind, it's very possible that God is attracted to Saitama specifically, for the very very fact that he has the ability to not only transcend time and travel through the multiverse, he's also an absolute certainty and a controller of causality, someone that can always stand in the way of his evil plans for Earth, much like he did with Garo. This could all tie back to the fact that Saitama is the only known being to have removed his limiter, and therefore might be the only one that can reach the ceiling required to travel through time and the multiverse. I've referenced this in a ton of my videos by now, but it's been theorized by a lot of people that the limiter was something that was created by God himself, and then placed on humanity in order to keep them weak enough to easily control them. This is because in Dr. Genus's explanation of the limiter in chapter 88, he pretty much says it verbatim. So seeing as how Saitama is now in the crosshairs of God as a problem that needs to be dealt with at all costs, 
God could take it upon themselves to use their access to the multiverse as a way to get rid of Saitama since there's currently no one on Saitama's world that can even come close to his power. With that in mind, consider this potential future arc of the story. At some point, God obtains enough power or sacrifices to fully access the multiverse at will, and even gains the ability to move beings to and from various alternate planets, basically able to teleport them back and forth. This would allow him to collect an army of fighters from all different universes who each possess an insane amount of power in their own right. And what better army than all the Saitamas from alternate universes that turned evil for one reason or another and accepted God's power. This way they'd be insanely strong but they also never removed their limiters like our original Saitama did, so they're still not quite on his level. So to give a good example, I'm gonna have to spoil the comic book series and now animated series. but I imagine it going down a lot like the Invincible War arc of the series. In this arc, a supervillain brings in several Mark Graysons from various alternate universes where he had actually turned evil, and they wreak all sorts of havoc on the main planet. Super crazy arc, definitely one of my favorites of the entire series, but I digress. At the end of it all, the evil Saitamas would be defeated, but it would also cause an interesting dynamic where after witnessing the destructive power Saitama is capable of, the public and the majority majority of the Hero Association might see him as a threat. That would actually be a pretty cool thing to witness in the manga in my opinion, as it wouldn't take much convincing for the public to turn on Saitama, since he's already seen as a fraud and a cheater by many people that don't know him. Regardless of whether that storyline ever comes to fruition though, I'm pretty damn certain that the whole time travel sequence with Garo and then Genos' long-winded explanation was pretty much a soft introduction to the concept of the multiverse that'll be played upon upon more heavily later on in the story. It's a lot like how Monster King Orochi and his monster cells were essentially a soft introduction to God and the way he's able to grant power through his cubes. Orochi's pretty much a budget version of God if you think about it, so he could have been used as a vehicle to introduce the idea that someone can obtain an insane amount of power by becoming a monster through external means, not just by mutating the old-fashioned way. The same might have been the goal with the whole time travel stuff and the explanation that Genos gave about the possibility of the multiverse, even if it was brushed off comically as an afterthought. A multiverse in One Punch Man really does open the door to an incredible amount of possibilities for the story going forward. And with that being said, I definitely want to hear your multiverse theories in the comments below. Can't wait to see what kind of crazy shit you guys come up with, but that does it for me today. I'll see you guys in the next video. Did Saitama just turn Genos' character arc upside down by defeating the mad cyborg before Genos can get his hands on him? That's the interesting question that Saitama himself brought up in chapter 186 of the manga. The mad cyborg was brought up in the main storyline for the first time in years now, and this is when Saitama wonders if Genos ever considered the possibility that the mad cyborg has already been defeated. Genos highly doubts this because he hasn't seen a single report of a hero defeating a cyborg of that strength in all the time that the Hero Association has existed. Well, this is when Saitama brings up the aforementioned question. Well, what if I'm the one that defeated the mad cyborg? And while Genos doesn't deny the fact that Saitama is capable of this, he argues that Saitama would have at least remembered fighting the mad cyborg, seeing as how it was so powerful. I always thought this was a very interesting line for one to add, and it certainly led to a portion of the community arguing that this might actually end up being the case, that this is actually one foreshadowing the end of the Genos and mad cyborg arc, because you know, why else would he bring it up? That's kind of the argument. And although I'm not here to argue whether or not that would be a good ending to that whole storyline. What I am here to do is play devil's advocate and kind of lay out the groundwork for how this could possibly make sense within the story. The first major argument that someone would have here is how would Saitama possibly not remember fighting the mad cyborg? It seems like such a unique type of monster that there's no way that Saitama would forget it. Well Saitama himself in this chapter points out that there is a good chance that he would forget fighting the mad cyborg if he did because he doesn't remember the vast majority of the monsters he's defeated. I mean, just think about it. If you talk to Saitama about Carnage Kabuto or Boros's commanders, 
or that giant titan sized monster at the beginning of the anime, there's a good chance that Saitama wouldn't have any freaking clue about who you were talking about and you wouldn't think twice about it because that's just how Saitama is. Well, although the mad cyborg might be much more powerful than all these monsters, to Saitama it would probably still be nothing. So right there that opens the window to this being possible. The other thing we have to consider is the fact that the mad cyborg was first created four years ago from the current timeline and Saitama didn't start his training to becoming the strongest until three years before the current timeline. So that means that the mad cyborg destroyed Genosis town a whole year before Saitama even started his training. So taking into account the time that it took for Saitama to remove his limiter and become strong enough to even be able to defeat the mad cyborg, we're looking at about a two or three year timetable from the day that the mad cyborg was last seen and when Saitama would have been able to beat it in a one on one. So that being considered, let's start the timeline here. Four years ago, the mad cyborg is first created and goes on a rampage and destroys multiple towns including Genosis. After this point, the mad cyborg is never heard from again. This raises the question, well, what happened to it then? Well, Genos describes the mad cyborg as this like rampaging machine. Well, every cyborg that we've seen in the story, including Genos and Drive Knight and others, seems to be highly intelligent, and I highly doubt that the Mad Cyborg would be any different. It is possible that we're looking at a Mad Genius scenario, where the Mad Cyborg is very evil and very destructive, but in a calculated way, it's doing it with a purpose, and every move it makes is methodical. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been able to lay low for so long. The Mad Cyborg probably realized that it needed to lay low for a while, and create this base of operations for it to lay dormant in, and possibly recuperate all of its power from destroying all those towns, or possibly some other sinister reasons. Reason. Well, of course, the best way to evade detection is staying away from heavy populated areas like all of the cities from A to Z. So there's a good chance that the mad cyborg set up a base of operations somewhere in the middle of nowhere, somewhere deep in the woods or something. Think of the house of evolution that Dr. Gene has created, where it's this super high tech lab sitting in the middle of nowhere hiding in plain sight. So after the mad cyborg creates this laboratory or base, it then goes dormant. Well, a year later, Saitama starts his journey to becoming the strongest, and a few years after that, he ends up removing his limiter and become strong enough to defeat insanely powerful monsters. We also got to consider that Saitama fresh off of removing his limiter is still probably excited about the prospect of fighting new opponents. It isn't until Saitama's overpowered for a while that he starts to get like really lethargic and really detached from humanity and his own emotions. So we kind of have to put ourselves in a mind frame of a Saitama that's actively looking for more and more worthy adversaries and trying to find them wherever he can. Well as I just said earlier, the mad cyborg would more than likely be hidden somewhere in the woods or somewhere in the middle of nowhere. So what business would Saitama have being out there in the first place? After all, 99% of the time that we see Saitama, he's in his apartment or he's within one of the cities, going to the grocery store or fighting monsters, whatever. Well, we actually see in one of the One Punch Man bonus chapters that Saitama saves this kid from this snowman monster and then goes on to fight this insanely huge snowman monster that's like the size of a mountain. And it looks like he's in the middle of nowhere. Also, when Saitama's all down on himself when he realizes is that nobody knows who he is. Even though he's defeated all these crazy strong monsters, it definitely seems like Saitama has really been through it in defeating some ultra powerful monsters and not all of them could have possibly been within city limits seeing as how most of the cities would have been probably destroyed if this was the case. So this all goes to say that there is a good chance that Saitama would routinely be scouting these middle of nowhere areas looking for the next powerful monster. Well one day as he's doing this he stumbles across the base that the mad cyborg created and Seeing as how the Mad Cyborg is now laying dormant, it is possible that the Mad Cyborg created defense robots and scouting robots in order to retrieve resources to help replenish its power. Well, Saitama might have stumbled across one of these scouting robots and followed it to the base, where he gets curious and decides to try and walk in. The Mad Cyborg would undoubtedly have some massive, insanely powerful defense robots protecting it, but much like Dr. Bofoy's defense robots from the Hero Association, Saitama would take them out no problem and very quickly. This would reactivate the Mad Cyborg and make it realize that there's somebody trespassing in his hidden base and go to eliminate the target himself. Well, there's no suspense here because we all know that Saitama would one-shot it and probably be very underwhelmed with the Mad Cyborg's power and just end up making his way back to Z-City in time for the next deal at the supermarket. Well, the events of the manga go on as they do. Saitama meets Genos a year or two later. He becomes his disciple. They go through all the major arcs of the story and it's finally time for Genos to come face to face with the Mad Cyborg. Well, once Genos finally locates the base that the mad cyborg has been hiding this entire time, he stumbles across a complete mess. Like there's all these destroyed robots everywhere and he notes that there's these humanoid cyborg parts just sprawled out all over the ground. That seems like they haven't been touched in a while. After a while of Genos pondering what the 
hell's going on. Saitama thinks to go check up on Genos and provide backup if he needs it or something. And as he's approaching the mad cyborg's hidden base, he starts to think to himself like, wait, why does this stuff all look kind of familiar? And it's not until he actually reaches Genos that he realizes, wait, I've been here before and I destroyed some super powerful cyborg like a year ago. And this is when it all hits Genos and he realizes that Saitama really did defeat the mad cyborg. And Genos has been working towards this unattainable goal this entire time. But this is when his mentor Saitama or somebody else would kind of come in and make Genos realize the error of his ways. That in pursuit of revenge against this mad cyborg, he altered his body, became less and less human, and all the rage and need for revenge within him slowly turned him into a mad cyborg himself. Now the reason why I see this as being like the character arc that one would go with if he decides to go with this storyline is for two reasons. One because he might make this a similar story arc to Dimple from Mob Psycho, one of his other works, where you know I'm not going to spoil anything here but Dimple has this grand goal of being a god but by the end of the story he realizes that even if he obtained all of this power that he wanted, all he really wanted in the end was to be accepted and to have friends. You know that super cheesy classic shonen character arc right? He also has his character arc for a lot of the other characters in the same series so it's very possible that one likes to play on the whole you know what you wanted wasn't what you really wanted trope with the storytelling at times which isn't a bad thing it's just is what it is. Well aside from this the seeds for this character arc for Genos have already actually been planted in the same chapter that all this stuff is being discussed because what also happens in chapter 186 is that Genos challenges Saitama to a rematch from the first fight they had way way back in season one of the anime where the first fight ends with Saitama throwing a death punch to Genos and the force from that punch creates this enormous dust cloud behind him. Well in the rematch a very similar thing happens but it's actually Genos who throws the punch that creates this massive dust cloud. They're drawn very similarly and I don't think this was an accident I think this was intentional in showing just how far Genos has come but if you guys remember in that first fight Genos thinks to himself that there's no way he could ever possibly see himself becoming that powerful and creating this massive impact just from the force of a punch and here he is in the rematch actually doing it so you would assume that Genos would be proud of himself for coming this far but it's actually quite the opposite for him he's kind of having this existential crisis where he feels like he's never strong enough and he has this deep feeling of stagnation where he feels like he'll never reach the power necessary to defeat the mad cyborg essentially setting up that Genos is never living in the moment and appreciating what's going on right now he's completely blinded by revenge and always wanting more well this would bring things full circle fast forwarding to the moment that Genos realizes that the mad cyborg has been dead this entire time and his character arc would be him realizing all these toxic tendencies that he has and kind of leaving it all behind him this would lead to Genos now wanting to become strong for himself and not for some vengeful goal therefore rounding out the Genos and mad cyborg storyline now as I said at the top of this video I'm not here arguing that this is a direction that one should go with the storyline on the contrary this would be very anticlimactic for me like I'm sure it would be for many of you I definitely want to see that shiny moment where Genos finally comes face to face with the mad cyborg and completely demolishes it and finally giving Genos a W since all he does right now is take L's and destroy his body that would be very satisfying for me to see Genos versus Saitama round 3 will be to the death. Genos has two matches with Saitama under his belt already, but the final one will be against a Saitama that's straight up out for blood. And even more surprising than that, I am almost certain that Genos will come out on top in the end this time. <laughs> Now you might be wondering at this point, what is this guy smoking? How are Genos and Saitama ever going to be in a situation where they have to fight to the death and how the hell would Genos Bruh. ever manage to win in this case? Well just sit back and make sure to stick around until the end as I go through the surprisingly complex road to this ultimate fight that includes things like the mad cyborg, the organization, and much more. In chapter 186 of the manga we saw Saitama and Genos have their second sparring match where Genos' growth was put on full display play with his newly revealed lightning core. Although it didn't connect, the force from Genos' punch created a massive dust cloud that was on par with the death punch that Saitama threw in their first match. This alone should have proved to Genos how far he's come because he himself even said when he first witnessed the death punch that he couldn't fathom ever becoming that strong and here he is performing a similar feat. On the contrary though, Genos points out that he feels like his strength hasn't even approached the steps of Saitama.
Saitama's and he has this overwhelming feeling of stagnation. Being Saitama's equal has always been his goal when it comes to strength and it's understandable why Genos feels so stagnant no matter how strong he becomes because no one is close or ever will be close to Saitama's level of power. This leaves Genos continuously wanting more and never being satisfied until he can stand shoulder to shoulder with his master. So hang on to this motivation for Genos because it does come back into play later. We see this unhealthy drive to become stronger become more prevalent when the mad cyborg is involved. We see Genos getting all fired up over gaining more power after he thinks about the mad cyborg in the same chapter. Now the reason I bring up the mad cyborg here is because it actually plays a major role in the setup of what I think is Genos' final battle with Saitama. See in the webcomic the mad cyborg storyline seemingly is reaching its climax where Genos is now on his way to Dr. Bofoy's lab where apparently the mad cyborg has been lying dormant this entire time. It's questionable information that comes from Drive Night and that alone makes it kind of sketchy but that's a topic for a different video. Regardless this comes after Dr. Kuseno was killed by machine gods sent by the organization who were sent to eliminate him and destroy his lab. Now this is where the real meat of the theory today comes into play because if you remember at the time that Kuseno's lab was being destroyed Saitama was sleeping in this incubation chamber having data collected from him by Kuseno. It's still up in the air what happens to this collected data because we don't see what becomes of his destroyed lab after Genos gets his final upgrades. However, considering that it was the organization that targeted the lab, it's a safe bet that they'd try to recover this data at all costs. The organization is a mysterious group that's been shown to have a high level of interest in collecting battle data from powerful opponents through the various machine gods they've sent out during the manga's run. There's that machine god that was sent out to fight King, and also the machine god that was sent out during the Monster Association arc that has this like samurai aesthetic and was sent to help them. It's still up in the air what they plan to do with all of this data they've collected but it would make sense that it's to create more and more powerful cyborgs or robots. That's why collecting data from these strongest opponents seems to be priority number one for them so there's no doubt that data from Saitama would be the freaking holy grail to them. It's unlikely that one set up this data collection in the webcomic for no apparent reason so it's almost certainly going to come back into play later. After all the organization got a taste of Saitama's power when he one-shotted Machine God Mirror earlier in the webcomic, so the data that Kuseno collected wouldn't be the first of Saitama's data they've obtained. It seems like the organization was completely unaware of Saitama since Machine God Mirror tried brushing him off as it was trying to fight other heroes. This means that after this encounter, collecting more data from Saitama would be at the top of their list. On top of this, we have to consider the fact that once this section of the story is retold in the manga version, Kuseno's lab might also be housing the alternate timeline energy core that Saitama brought back from his fight with Garo. This was of course the core that came from the dead Genos of that timeline that recorded that entire fight. This was actually brought up in a recent video I did with Zonin, another awesome anime YouTuber, so make sure to check out that video after you're done with this one. And hey, why not subscribe to me while you're at it if you're enjoying this video. So this core might hold the most valuable data of all because it documents the incredible level of power Saitama reached in his fight with Garo, and just as importantly I think, recorded the power from an avatar of God. This means that even if the data that Kuseno collected was incomplete, let's say at 75% or something, then the data from the core would round out the other 25%. That's not to say that this data would match 100% of Saitama's power, because Saitama's potential strength is limitless as we saw in that fight but it would complete 100% of the data that they need for their purposes. This would give the organization everything they need to create a cyborg Saitama or even a clone of him. After all, we've seen that cloning has been proven to be possible in One Punch Man through Dr. Genus and a group as advanced as the organization would have no problem replicating this. So now that we have this cyborgified Saitama clone cooking in a chamber like Goku on Namek, the next question is, how is Genos going to end up fighting this insanely strong opponent. Well at the moment, Genos is completely unaware that the organization specifically targeted Kuseno, so Dr. Bofoy is likely not to blame for Kuseno's death. It's likely that Genos would have his final match with the Mad Cyborg and uncover this information. Once Genos comes to this realization, he'll set his sights on destroying the organization entirely and eventually find their base of operations. This is when they'll unveil their strongest creation yet, a cyborg clone of Saitama. Now I do have to note that it's an 
impossible to replicate the power of Saitama one for one because the fact that he's someone that's removed their limiter plays a major role in why he's so incredibly broken. But a cyborg clone loaded with his battle data would still undoubtedly be one of the strongest antagonists we've seen in the story yet. It's even possible that with the data from the Energy Core, the organization managed to replicate God's power or even harness his power directly. I mean, we've seen that God is just begging to give his power to others if it means they're going to wreak havoc with it, so it wouldn't be such a far-fetched idea. Considering Genos was able to take down three Dragon-level Machine Gods at once, his final upgrades from Kuseno would put Genos on a whole new tier of strength, making this an actually competitive fight. The Saitama Cyborg would likely have the original's moveset with no normal and serious punches, along with whatever other goofy stuff that Saitama comes up with, and Genos would have to fight back with his high battle IQ and insanely powerful upgrades. Along with being completely epic, this fight would signify a really important point in Genos' character arc, because to that point, Genos had continuously chased Saitama's level of strength with modifications and upgrades, but seeing as how there are no more upgrades to be had for Genos now, it would be good old fashioned fighting spirit and desire he'd need to come out with a victory here. Cyborg Saitama would be able to learn and adapt as he fights Genos, but we all know that our boy Genos would come out on top in the end after outsmarting the inexperienced Cyborg. It's also possible if the Mad Cyborg was a creation of the organization, Genos might have uncovered a fatal flaw in the designs that they have for their Cyborgs and use this information on this newly formed Cyborg Saitama. I mean, he's more than likely going to have to find some kind of loophole like this in order to be a Cyborg Saitama because, I mean, come on, Saitama knockoff or not, this would be an extremely tough challenge for Genos. Genos. All those L's that Genos has been taking throughout the entire series Wait. finally pay off here. After destroying the Saitama Cyborg, Genos would finally reach his goal. He avenges Dr. Kuseno by destroying the organization's top project, and he finally feels a level of accomplishment for defeating such a powerful opponent, using his own fighting ability and inner strength rather than continuous upgrades. It's likely that up until this point, Genos had felt stagnant because of the fact that he'd mainly been getting stronger through through artificial means, and now he finally did it on his own. Things would feel different this time. Therefore, in a roundabout way, Genos would finally get his win over Saitama. The biggest fight in all of One Punch Man has just been set up, and of course it involves our favorite overpowered Baldi, Saitama. And let me just say right now, it's going to be the biggest and baddest fight we'll ever see in the series. The plot on how this fight is going to happen has just been revealed, and I feel like nobody's talking about it weirdly. Well, I'm going to change all that right here with this video and break down this incredibly important development to all of you. Don't worry, I got your back. Since the end of the Monster Association arc, where we we got to witness the epic battle between Saitama and Garo, many fans have been wondering when the next big fight will happen. I mean, this fight quite literally transcended time and space, and the fight bounced from Earth to Jupiter back to Earth, ending with freaking time travel. Say what you want about the whole time travel thing, whether you like it or not, you can't deny that the fight itself and the art from those chapters were absolutely incredible. Since then, the story has been building up the next major arc of the series, that being the Neo Heroes arc, and we've also had some smaller arcs sprinkled in as that one's cooking in the background. We of course just had the Psychic Sisters arc where Saitama and Tatsumaki fought, which was pretty awesome in itself and also introduced a lot of cool Esper lore, that's always welcomed. And now we're currently in what seems to be a ninja arc, where Flashy Flash and Sonic are taking center stage. What's been very exciting with this arc in particular though, is the involvement of Blast and the introduction of a new ultra powerful opponent, the ninja leader. In chapter 196, we learn of the mysterious ninja village where Flashy Flash is from, and we also find out that Blast had visited the ninja village sometime after Flashy Flash abandoned it and totally wrecked the place. Well, it turns out that the village was so wrecked by Blast because he was there trying to reclaim the god cube that was sitting there. We first got to see the cube in one of Flashy Flash's flashbacks. The biggest surprise from this chapter though is that we got the crazy reveal that the super powerful ninja leader that has been lying dormant for 15 years is actually Blast's former partner 
partner and close friend. His name is Empty Void, and he accepted power from God at some point and became a monster. Not only is he ultra strong, we also found out that Empty Void has a completely broken ability that gives him and him alone the access to the monster god himself. Bless explains in chapter 196 that Empty Void has the ability to open a dimensional portal called the Gate of the Celestial Rock Cave, which connects their world to the dimension where God is hiding. This is an absolutely massive reveal because it has some pretty big implications. It means that although Blast can travel through dimensions with his powers, there's at least one if not more dimensions that he can't have access to. It also means that the power of Empty Void is absolutely integral to the final fight against God. Without this ability, things can't progress. One Punch Man fans by now agree for the most part that the final fight of the series is going to be between Saitama and God. There's never really been a question there. The real question has always been how. How is this incredible fight to end all fights going to happen? Well, this chapter finally gives us that answer, and I feel like not many people have been talking about it. I don't know why. I mean, we just discovered someone that can go directly to the dimension where God's been hiding this whole time. In theory, if they manage to turn Empty Void into a human again, and he opens the gate that leads to God, Saitama can just walk through it and take care of God right there and then, right? Well, it's likely not that simple, and chances are it won't be Saitama going to God once the gate is opened, but it'll be God coming to Saitama. On top of that, I think the power to open the gate of the Celestial Rock Cave is something that will be used by none other than Flashy Flash and Sonic and not Empty Void. Sounds batshit crazy, I know, but just sit tight and let me explain how this chapter alone signifies how the most epic fight in One Punch Man and possibly all of manga is going to be set up. Just trust me, it all makes sense in the end. First of all, like many things in manga, the Celestial Rock Cave is actually something that exists in Japanese mythology. According to the Nihon Shoki, which is one of the oldest writings in Japanese history, there's a story where the bad behavior of Susano, the Japanese god of storms, drove his sister Amaterasu into the Amato Awado Cave, aka the Celestial Rock Cave. In order to get Amaterasu out of the cave, called upon one god in particular, whose name I'm not even going to bother trying to pronounce because I'm going to embarrass myself, the point is they called on this god to throw a massive party outside of the cave. Japanese mythology is weird, but just bear with me. Other gods joined in to essentially give Amaterasu a fat case of FOMO in order to lure her out of the cave. It ended up working because Amaterasu grew curious about the source of all the amusement outside of the cave and peeked outside the entrance. Much like a My Mask in the Monster Association arc, as soon as she left the cave, she was distracted by how good she looked in a mirror that was planted there by the other gods. In the time she was checking herself out, the other gods closed closed off the cave forever with the holy seal. Now I don't think one and Murata are gonna follow this story to a T and write up this scenario where God is lured out of his dimension and tricked with the mirror to check himself out or anything. I do think however that the inverse of what happened to Amaterasu in this story is what happened to God. It's likely that he was sealed away in the celestial rock cave by a seal of some kind, possibly creating all the God cubes that are currently in the series and these cubes were scattered all over the place to prevent his return. The cave is likely the dimensional space Saitama, Flashy, and Monaco discovered while they were trapped underground. That dark space did look pretty cavey after all. Well, now that we have all that cleared up, it's now time to explain how Flashy Flash and possibly Sonic are going to gain the insane power to access God directly. With all the ninjas we've been introduced to throughout the series, none of them have really ever shown any type of supernatural abilities, right? Sure, ninjas like Hellfire can conjure flames on his blade and stuff like that, but I can't imagine any ninja, even one as strong as Empty Void, being able to inherently use an ability to access other dimensions, let alone one that leads to God himself. What I think is that he has a tool that allows him to do this, specifically the two swords on his back. When we first get the face reveal of Empty Void before he became a monster, we see that he has two distinct blades on his back. The first chapter we ever see him in general is in the chapter Secret Intel, where again we distinctly see those two blades across his back. In the webcomic, the blades on the ninja leader's back are considered to be legendary demon blades, and he also has access to forbidden ninja scrolls. It's likely that one if not both of these blades are necessary to open the Celestial Rock Cave, seeing as how Flashy Flash is in need of a new main blade 
blade after losing insta-kill, it only makes sense that he takes ownership of one of these legendary blades, and it's likely Sonic will take the other one considering he's taking kind of a pseudo good guy role in this arc, and is seemingly being set up to be Flashy Flash's rival. So once Empty Void is defeated, if he ever is defeated, he'll likely have the two blades on his back taken by Flashy Flash and Sonic, and that's when we might get the reveal that these two blades are the tools needed to open the gate that leads to God. If this is the case, it makes sense that Blast had been collecting the God cubes all these years, because these cubes are possibly needed to open the gate as well. Once all the cubes are collected, the two swords would be used to literally cut the gate open that leads to the Celestial Rock Cave, and finally give access to God. It's likely the cubes are essential to this whole process, or else Blast would have made it to God way earlier while Empty Void was still on the good side, since he could have just opened the gate any time. It's also possible there are sacred scrolls or something that might be needed to open the gate as well, kind of following the ninja theme of all this. And this would also make sense since the ninja village itself is in the shape of one of the god cubes, which Flashy Flash points out himself is likely designed to replicate the god cube that was stored there. That tells us that God and his power is deep deeply ingrained in the culture and the history of the ninja village, so I wouldn't be surprised if there are other sacred ninja items hidden at the village that were created with God in mind. At the end of the series, it'll likely be a massive cast of characters teaming up to fight against God and the calamities he's sure to bring with him, so it's only fitting that Flashy Flash and Sonic team up at some point to help in the fight against God, and this is exactly how they would do it. Either way, this arc just introduced a way to directly access God, and I'm excited to see how this discovery is going to influence the story going forward, but one thing is for damn sure, the gate of the Celestial Rock Cave is now the only thing standing between God and Saitama, and once that gate is opened, God isn't going to be greeted with a mirror and a party like a Matarasu was. Bro's going to get greeted with a big ol' ass whooping. For those of you that are hardcore or even casual fans of overpowered bald guys, we know that One Punch Man is a series full of comical relief and incredible action sequences. I mean, really, it's what it's known for. However, these aspects of the series can sometimes overshadow the honestly incredible writing that brings it all together. I mean, this series is probably the first one I've ever read where I found myself actively rooting for the villain throughout his entire run. If that's not great writing, then then I don't know what is. Along with well-written characters, one, the creator of One Punch Man, is a master of writing engaging plot lines and building up his story arcs to have an incredibly satisfying payoff in the end. Well, what if I told you guys there's an arc in One Punch Man that is currently going on that has actually been slowly building up since the very beginning of the series? An arc that we as readers have been slowly getting spoon-fed new developments on as the story has gone along, with most of us probably not even realizing it. I'm of course referring to the God arc, the supposed end game of One Punch Man where God, the unfathomably powerful final villain of the series, will finally be resurrected. An arc that'll see a universal God fighting one-on-one -on -one with the God for fun. Well, the big question for me is, how? How are we going to get to this cataclysmic and world-ending final battle? That's a pretty big question and I think I have a pretty big answer and I think by the end of this video the answer might leave you not being able to see One Punch Man the same way again because the amount of information hidden in plain sight throughout the entire series and all the moving characters and plot lines happening behind the scenes to make this all come together is honestly pretty damn eye-popping so get your tinfoil hats on and get ready for quite the theory ride as we try and uncover the end of One Punch Man. So what do we know about God at this point? Well, he's freaking massive. So massive, in fact, that he has to be in a fetal position to fit his physical body inside of the moon. We've also seen throughout the manga that he is able to communicate with humans telepathically in several ways. Coming into direct contact with mysterious cubes scattered around the planet is one way. Another way is by having a weak heart and despising humanity so much that God takes notice and grants you power in hopes of carrying out his will. The third way 
which we'll be primarily covering in this video, is by being an Esper who has gained the third eye ability and is able to see into the future. Regardless of how someone in the One Punch Man story makes contact with God, the result is almost always the same. God appears with a single primary goal, to grant power to those who will carry on his will, and in some cases, even wanting them to become his full-on avatar. With all this in mind, you gotta ask yourself, why is God working in such a sly and cunning way if he has power so great that even sharing a sliver of it produces a planet-busting, God-level threat like Cosmic Fear Garo? Well, the simple answer is that he has to, and the reason for that is the result of a massive event that took place many years before the events of the current manga. Surprisingly, we've already been secretly told of this massive event by one himself in the only way he knows how, through comic relief. I'm sure many of you have been told at nauseum by other YouTubers at this point how chapter 119 of the webcomic is one's clever way of revealing the end game of the series while hiding it in plain sight. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, in chapter 119 of the webcomic, we see Saitama fight off a random guy claiming to carry the power of the dragon blood. Well, after making quick work of him, we're told by these weird guys in medieval armor that Saitama has just stepped into a centuries-old battle between a group called the Saints and another group called Deathbone. They claim that long ago, there was a cruel dragon that appeared that was so fearsome that it created large-scale destruction and death across the entire planet, and it wasn't until many great warriors gathered to fight this dragon that they were able to weaken him. In his weakened state, his essence was sealed away by sorcerers into nine cube-shaped seal stones and scattered them into nine temples. Saitama then goes on to speedrun the temples and one-shots the resurrected dragon. The reason people claim the cruel dragon is a parallel to God is primarily because there is a pretty clear connection between the seal stones and the god cubes where they both seem to have the same purpose of sealing them away. This theory was also given some legs during Garo and Saitama's battle where a massive blow from Garo sent shockwaves throughout the entire planet and uncovered a mysterious temple from the ocean which also had a dragon statue that greatly resembles the cruel dragon. Whether or not the god cubes function in the same way as the seal stones by locking away the essence of God, at the very least, I believe he was sealed away in a similar way that was told in the Cruel Dragon story because it explains why God has to use all these underhanded tactics to carry on his plan of resurrection. However, God is not alone in this goal and his influence reaches much farther than you might think right now. In chapter 173 of the manga, we're introduced to a mysterious and powerful esper with stitches across his forehead. He appeared at a hero association prison to claim Psychos, someone he states is essential to the research of the Tsukiyomi, which for those of you who don't know, literally translates to moon god in English. He claims that Psychos' mutated body and third eye ability are particularly important to them, and in chapter 174, it's revealed by Tatsumaki that the mysterious man is from the research group that kept her captive as a child. And on top of that, they are also in the business of creating artificial espers, the mysterious man being one of them. Chapter 174 also speaks of a psychic research group called the Invisible Hand, so it's possible that Tsukiyomi are the artificial espers themselves, and the Invisible Hand is the group that creates them. Even on the surface, this comes as a massive reveal, but but digging deeper into the implications of this information, a whole can of worms opens up and reveals a connective tissue that makes everything come together. Taking a look at Tatsumaki's flashback where she is a young kid being experimented on at the research facility where she was held captive, one day a dangerous hybrid monster broke out of his incubation and wreaked havoc on the whole place. Tatsumaki was ready to accept death before being saved by Blast. We then see in her conversation with Blast immediately after, that he is also holding a god cube, alluding to the fact that the research facility was holding it and using it as a part of their research. So there's a lot going on in this flashback, but the main things I want to focus on here are the cube, the hybrid monsters, and the fact that we now know that espers are being artificially created here. Seeing as how the invisible hand is keen on obtaining the third eye ability, it's possible that this ability not only serves as a way to see into the future, but also serves as a way to reach god 
God himself. At this point, it's made pretty clear that God's physical body is being stored in the moon and his consciousness is the entity that actually is granting the power to humans and is influencing the earth. He's pretty much a ghost floating around doing his evil godly deeds and such. As seen in chapter 164, where God appears before Garo to grant him power, no one else but him is able to actually see God. On top of that, in chapter 171, Sitch explains that Blast is the only one that can actually fight against God since he is the only one that can manipulate space and time. This leads to the conclusion that God is currently operating in this multi-dimensional space separated from the world that can be perceived by humans. Since the third eye ability allows one to see into the future, it might be inherently allowing the user to break the dimensional barrier separating God from the earth, seeing as how observing time like this is only possible in a fourth dimensional space. Meaning God is on a different plane than everybody else. And the only way to reach that plane is by obtaining multi-dimensional abilities like being able to see into the future. This could also explain why God appeared at the moment Garo was teaching Saitama how to time travel, this action creating a temporary break in the dimensional barrier separating God from Earth, a barrier that is also alluded to by Blast himself. I actually theorized in a video I made a few months ago that this facility was where artificial espers like potentially Gearspur were being created and with this actually turning out to be the case, it kind of left me wondering why they would be doing this while also researching the cube and creating these hybrid monsters. Well, there are two possibilities to explain this but they both lead to the same result. One possibility is that the invisible hand is creating these hybrid monsters to create a strong enough vessel for God, seeing as how they have a cube, it wouldn't be a stretch to assume that they have made contact with God and are working alongside him to create a worthy vessel for his resurrection. After all, we saw God not only try to grant power to Garo, but have him become his full-on avatar, so it would make sense that he'd put an emphasis on creating a worthy vessel. However, I think there's a much more likely possibility that reveals a much bigger web of God collaborators. I think the Invisible Hand's primary task is to create artificial espers as a small part of a larger plan and creating the hybrid monsters is a task put on them by a bigger and much more dangerous group. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the organization at this point, the ominous group working behind the scenes with unexplained motives. We've seen them unleash machine gods throughout the story with the intentions of collecting battle data, with one of them even being sent to assist the monster association. Their end goal seems to be a mystery at this point, but if the old saying is true, actions speak louder than words. Words. Like I alluded to earlier, their main purpose up until this point is to collect battle data, and they've gone about doing this in several ways throughout the story, one being through the aforementioned machine gods, and another by using data collected from the battle suits stolen by Hammerhead and the Paradisers. It's also been theorized that the battle suits that are currently being used by the Neo heroes in the webcomic continuity and the ones used by the Paradisers are the same. This theory also states that the cyborgified monsters that Child Emperor is currently studying are also a product of the organization, allowing them to collect double the data from battles between heroes wearing the suits and the powered up hybrid monsters they've created. Now I gotta ask you guys at this point, where have we seen hybrid monsters being created before? Probably get where I'm going here, right? This is where everything starts to come full circle. Well, before we flesh all of that out, we have to zero in on a few specific characters in the story. There are two or potentially three characters involved in all of this that bring brings all of it together. The first being Fuzzy, the creator of the Neo Heroes. It's revealed in chapter 137 of the webcomic that Fuzzy is actually the son of the late and great seer, Lady Shababua, who is the one who died just after predicting the terrible future awaiting humanity, aka God's arrival. It's also stated that he too possesses the third eye ability to see into the future. With this crucial bit of information in mind, his creation of the Neo Heroes retroactively makes a lot of sense. If he's able to break into this dimensional space that we talked about earlier by using his ability and can communicate with God, it's likely that he is a disciple of God's that is working towards his resurrection as well. Seeing as how the organization also has this goal, Fuzzy could have easily been reached out to by them to create a scenario where they can freely collect data they need through the already ongoing 
battle between humans and monsters by injecting hybrid monsters and battle suits into the equation, hiding everything in plain sight. Now, there is also another major player in all of this, which leads us to Metal Knight and Drive Knight. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole theory of whether Drive Knight is a traitor who is secretly working with the organization or if it's in fact Metal Knight doing this. Regardless of where you stand on this debate, I want to emphasize a conversation between Drive Knight and Genos that might have a larger relevance than we originally thought. Now that we have all of this context in mind, in chapter 139 of the webcomic, Drive Knight reveals that the reason he told Genos to stay away from Metal Knight earlier in the series was to protect him from Dr. Bofoy. Drive Knight then points out that it would be a real problem if Bofoy were to get his hands on the technology behind Genos' reinforced muscle fibers, artificial nerves, and energy core. Again, whether or not Drive Knight is telling the truth here, or he's actually just projecting his intentions onto Metal Knight, it's not important to the overall plan. In this conversation, it's made clear that whoever is working with the organization is after the technology behind Genos. This could explain why the organization sent several machine gods to destroy Dr. Kuseno's lab and kill him. It's likely they were looking to retrieve data that could allow them to replicate Kuseno's process of creating Genos' body to then create stronger and more durable hybrid monsters. Unfortunately, they may have also struck gold if they were somehow able to retrieve the data collected by the incubation chamber Saitama was sleeping in just before they showed up. On top of the hybrid monsters, if they are also looking to create the perfect vessel for God, all of this data would further their progress towards this goal greatly. With all this information in mind, we can paint a clear plan and many, many moving parts with the organization at the top of this operation. The organization teamed up with the Invisible Hand, who is also currently working toward creating a stable connection with God through artificial espers in hopes that one of these espers obtains the third eye ability that could then make that connection possible. On their end, the organization is giving the information and the data needed to create these hybrid monsters or even creating them themselves as well that again are being used to either collect more data that will then lead to creating a powerful enough vessel for God or creating a hybrid monster that can be the vessel itself. On an individual level, followers like Drive Knight or Dr. Bofoy work behind the scenes to gather the resources needed for these two groups to further their research while Fuzzy sets the stage for data to be gathered through the information collected from these battle suits created by the organization and the hybrid monsters that will now be enhanced even further through Dr. Kuseno's research. All of this taking place with a single goal in mind, the eventual arrival of God himself. Now, for all of you that couldn't follow all of that, the organization is in charge of creating the vessel for God, and the invisible hand is in charge of creating that necessary connection between God and the world for him to actually fuse with this worthy vessel, which of course apparently needs to all take place on the altar that we see during the Monster Association arc. All the dirty work and all the stuff that's making this plan possible is being done by the foot soldiers of God, that being Fuzzy and Drive Knight slash Dr. Bofoy. Well, that's all I've got for you guys today, so you can now take off your tinfoil hats. I am very, very curious to know what your thoughts are on all of this, if any of this stuff made sense to you, or if you guys think I'm freaking insane. Either opinion is valid, and I want to hear about it in the comments section, so let's have a conversation here. And if you enjoyed this video, you're going to enjoy all of the other One Punch Man content I have on this channel, so you definitely want to make sure you're subscribed with notifications on, along with liking this video if you enjoyed it, so you can get constant One Punch Man content each and every week. Well, that does it for this one, guys. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful day, and I'll see you guys in the next video.